Good day. I'm Martin Gagel with Market Radius Research. It's Wednesday, November the 9th, 2022. We've got CEO Steve Dalton and CEO Omar Bajorquez of Revolve Renewable Power. Revolve is a developer of solar, wind, and battery renewable power generation projects in the U.S. and Canada. It's great to have Steve and Omar join us today. Revolve has an operating portfolio of 2.85 megawatts with an additional 6.2 megawatts under construction. The company has developed and sold over 300 megawatts of projects and is targeting 5,000 megawatts of utility scale projects, along with a growing portfolio of revenue producing distributed generation assets. I'm looking forward to understanding their growth strategy and their opportunities in the US and Mexico, especially given Biden's Inflation Reduction Act as a tailwind. Also, I'm hoping to get an update on the state of the renewable energy market, especially how last year's rise in inflation, along with higher interest rates, is affecting project development. But please remember, this is neither recommendation nor investment advice. We're here to learn about the company. Steve Omar, thank you very much for joining us. And please tell us about Revolve. Appreciate it, Martin. Thanks very much uh, for the time to, to talk to you today. Looking forward to the discussion. Um, in, in terms of process, I'm going to hand over to Omar. Omar is going to walk, walk us through the presentation. Uh, and then I think between the two of us, hopefully we'll be able to get through any questions that you have as we uh, go through slide by slide. So I'll hand it over to Omar and we'll, we'll get, get through the presentation. Well, uh, thank you very much, Martin. So um, let's go you know, so we can talk about uh, the company. Um, what we can offer uh, for both. You know, so we, why this is an investment opportunity? It is because we offer, um, let's say, a smart and responsible investment opportunity. And this is because of three main uh, key facts. And it's the ESG, as we uh, can help companies to comply with their policies that they need to uh, put in place. And we will see it more often now uh, in, during these uh, coming years. Second, uh, we have a diversified uh, strategy, business strategy, that uh, it's about two different business models to tackle the renewable energy market. And third, uh, we, we know what we are doing. We have experience. We have a long track record in, in the sector. So about the company, uh, I would like to mention that we, we have uh, more than 10 years uh, of experience. Now we are listed on the uh, TSXV you know, since March uh, of this year. And we mainly have a portfolio of projects uh, on renewable energy uh, in the sector. And the, basically the technologies are uh, about wind, solar, and battery storage. And this is located, uh, our portfolio in, in the US and in Mexico. This, I think this, this slide is very good since it's like a snapshot of our present and of our future. Uh, our past and our and our present, let's say it that way. Since the 300 megawatts of projects that we have successfully developed, we have we have already contributed to uh, to the planet. Since uh, we have avoided 525 uh, thousand tons of CO2, and 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 this uh, represents uh, uh, or has represented. Uh, 17, 17 million uh, dollar uh, in revenue you know, uh, from, from the sale of the project, which meant for uh, our shareholders uh, on a five time return on investment. Mm -hmm. So our current portfolio, you know, it's, it's um, formed by a 3,600 megawatts uh, of individual renewable energy projects, uh, which which means that this is uh, ten times, uh, even I'm sorry, more than ten times of what we have done previously, and, and I have mentioned it. And this is not including the thousand, the one thousand two hundred megawatts of uh, greenfield projects that we have um, on the queue. Uh, so we are analyzing them, and uh, also it's it's a uh, in our portfolio is including, um, a, let's say, almost 
nine megawatts of capacity uh, on distributed generation projects that comes from uh, 2.8 uh, assets in operation and uh, 300 that are uh, installed, but waiting for some permits uh, just to proceed with, uh, with the operation and another 3.2 that will uh, that are just waiting for starting the works. And I think that this is uh, possible thanks to see that 60% that of our total shares issued uh, belongs uh, to the board, the management team, and the uh, insiders, some other insiders. So these uh, show ups uh, that the corporate uh, team, it's uh, fully aligned with the business strategy. And this is very important for, for the purposes of our shareholders' uh, interests. If you can just please, Steve. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a bit of background on my, on my own my own experience, uh, Martin. So I guess I've been in the sector for around twenty years now. I've spent pretty much all all of my all of my career in, in renewables. I uh, would have spent the first half of that as a kind of project financier of both renewable energy projects and infrastructure uh, here in in Ireland and the UK. And then around uh, twenty twelve, would have would have kind of left the financing world over to the development side of of the kind of sector. Um, where we would have co-founded, obviously, Raval, both myself and Omar and a number of our, our current directors. Um, and I've been kind of heavily involved in the sector across the whole kind of range of developing assets, financing, construction and operations. So fairly broad based experience, but pretty much all focused on renewable. And again, across those different technologies that, that Omar mentioned. So I think with, between myself and Omar, we've kind of been front and center of the company since we set it up back in uh, 2012. Steve, and, and your background, Ireland and the, the UK, maybe not a lot of solar there, but there's a whole lot of wind generation uh, in that part of the world, right? Yeah, not, well, would you believe a lot of solar now, not so much back when I was doing it back in kind of 20, 20 or 2006, 2007, it was, it was primarily wind, but uh, a, a lot more solar than there was there. But uh, yeah, I mean, originally it was all focused on wind, some biofuels, quite a lot of infrastructure. Um, but the, the same principles apply, I guess, in terms of permitting, uh, project financing, slight differences, obviously nuances with different technologies, but fundamentally the same kind of principles in terms of trying to get through permitting, getting projects financed uh, and kind of trying to generate that kind of long term recurring, recurring revenue. So skills are kind of easily applied. And I think that's the kind of approach we've taken to the business. And you'll, you'll see that a bit later on as we start to discuss it, that it's a fairly broad based business where we have kind of wind, solar, battery storage. We're not kind of pigeonholed as just a developer of a particular technology, we look, we take a more agnostic view as to kind of how we develop the projects. So um, um, as Steve was mentioned, you know, we're on a Davis basis uh, working on the company. So uh, in my case, I'm co-founder and, and a shareholder. Um, I have been involved on the 300 megawatts of uh, renewable projects uh, uh, done on, uh, on the ground. And uh, used to be, uh, the deputy commercial counselor for Bank of Mexico in London. And my uh, educational background is I have a bachelor degree in law you know, and I have uh, completed several uh, diploma certificates on energy, uh, corporate governance, and senior uh, business management in well, at uh, IPADE Business School. And what I would like just to mention about uh, uh, the other um, members of our management team uh, we we include a uh, great in uh, people with experience like royer norwich joseph O'Farrell, uh, jp mcguire uh, finn laden craig lindsay and jonathan clare and together they have uh, more than 100 years of experience in different topics you know, as a uh, public listed companies a uh, corporate governance um, energy uh, finances, um, new technologies, um, uh, investment banking, you know, and, and international uh, relations in, in the Americas and in Europe. When, when people uh, normally ask uh, to us about how important uh, is, how important uh, energy renewal, uh, renewable energies are in the energy sector, for me, the, the answer is, is very clear. Just uh, listen to the news on any uh, communication channel uh, about two main uh, key drivers, 
transition uh, to net zero emissions and the Inflation Reduction Act, no? that was uh, just uh, approved recently, you know, August of, uh, of this year. Um, so I think that these are a uh, key facts. So, so just to understand how everything is going to move uh, during the next uh, 10 years, over the next 10 years, uh, if, if, if you want, uh, I can just uh, explain uh, more in detail about how does this impact on, on, on our, our projects? And uh, so, about, Omar, yes, there, tell me. Sorry to in, interrupt. There, there are clearly a lot of sort of political and um, sort of societal factors pushing uh, renewable energy and so forth. I, I think something that not everyone is aware of this, but in many parts of the world, like closer to the equator zone, like solar is the cheapest form of electricity out there. It's not just that it's like we're feeling good, though the, like the economics drives these projects, uh, regardless of, of the subsidies and in some parts of the world, it's just the cheapest, best way to do it. Is that not the case? That's, I think that's the way it's got now, Martin. I think that's that's a position that's kind of developed over time, because if you look at how the industry has kind of transitioned really over the last 20 years, it kind of begun with those subsidies, as you kind of say, and that kind of drove a lot of the early capacity. But really since, and I mean, I think if you look at the, the graph here on, the, on, on my left, let's say as I look at it, it shows that renewable energy contracted by US corporations and that really steep upward curve from, from kind of 2015, 2016, and that's when you saw kind of renewable technology start to get more cost competitive with natural gas, particularly with coal, with other forms of generation. And then that's what that's what kind of drove this big upward curve along along with some of the other kind of factors that, like you mentioned, like I, I don't think you, you could point to any one to say that was the driver. It was a bit of everything, a bit of uh, some of the transition, the sustainability goals from some of these corporations backed up by maybe state mandates, particularly in the US, driving utilities to kind of go, go towards renewables. Um, then the cost aspect kicked in, which dro drove it up another leg. And then things like the Inflation Reduction Act and some of these, I guess, more later or latest kind of political kind of moves, I think they set the scene now for the next 10 years, which are, are going to, I guess, make this, this kind of graph look, uh, look small in comparison in terms of what's ahead of us over the next 10 years. So it's really been an evolving story, if you like, but but for the last kind of 15, 20 years, or certainly as, as, as long as I've been in, in the sector, you know, and it's it's less now about the subsidies and it's it's more about cost competitive, cost competitiveness of, of renewables. And on top of that, the kind of whole sustainability and drive towards kind of net zero. With one of the, let's say the benefits of coal or nuclear or natural gas versus renewables, except maybe like uh, hydro, is that they're not consistent throughout the day or the season where you get windy or sunny seasons, but that's where the bad backup battery helps smooth out the, does the load leveling. Uh, is the general competitiveness with those legacy energy, uh, electricity generation uh, technologies, once you add uh, battery, uh, to it to to do the load leveling did how how, how do the economics compare uh, with that included uh, it certainly helps i mean the battery does different things obviously it, it's, it doesn't generate electricity it just helps facilitate the management of the energy generated by solar wind or whatever else uh, it does other things like uh, allows the utilities and the, the transmission operators to be able to um, manage the grid in a better way so i think batteries add quite a lot to the overall network sitting alongside renewables it makes perfect sense and i think you're seeing that in the us where exactly. really you really don't see too many projects these days are, that are developed without batteries i mean that's certainly okay. at the large utility scale anyway if, if you look at the kind of queue network queues for transmission uh, requests a lot of them will will have a kind of battery element to it um, so i think it's def definitely a benefit for sure and it helps deal with some of those Kind of challenges that maybe we're throwing at the industry historically about this whole need for backup energy and how they manage the grid but i think that whole kind of story has moved on a huge amount because even the utilities themselves and the transmission system operators are just more a lot more adept at being able to manage their systems and and forecasting when let's say solar will come on or, or wind will come on and um, i know i know that's certainly the case here in ireland where the they, they do with quite a lot of fairly sophisticated forecasting around around uh, wind I think when you look at parts of the US and, and a, a, from a solar perspective, they can obviously tell within a reasonable amount day to day, to day that you're going to have a pretty good solar resource. So it makes it a bit bit easier to manage. But um, 
I think there's a lot of lot of different factors that are that are there, which are uh, which are a big improvement on, on before. Yeah, All right. I, I would like just to compliment that uh, why we mentioned these two uh, uh, topics as as key drivers, and it's because uh, first the WEC, the World Energy Council, has uh, many times has uh, announced about the transition to the diversification diversification of the energy matrix of the countries and of the companies. So this means basically two things, that uh, the reliance on, on, on fossil fuels need to uh, decrease and the reliance on renewable energy needs to increase, basically. And this has a big impact you know, on what the companies needs to promote on their uh, and to implement on their uh, business strategy since they now have to be uh, they, they have to be uh, sustainable and and of course uh, this is this is part of what all the United Nations members have already adopted with the uh, sustainable development goals where well, let's just remember you know, that number seven of this uh, list it's about energy you know, and, and we need to ensure access to affordable reliable sustainable you know, and modern energy for 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 everybody so now that we understand that this is a transition that for over the next 10 years, we will see that companies will need to implement, no? and, and for that, they will need this, uh, this strategy uh, on, 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 on to go to the net zero emissions no? in order to comply with uh, what I have mentioned before. And, and about, I mean, uh, what is happening with, with the US, no? and, and this is very important. The, the Inflation Reduction Act, no? It has, uh, I mean, we can tr translate it on uh, $369 billion you know, uh, on funding for clean technologies and, and for our projects and for all, all the projects uh, related with wind, solar, and battery storage projects. Uh, this is the, the impact. Um, according to what um, uh, Bloomberg has uh, forecast, um, the annual, for example, the annual uh, solar generation, it was previous in the U.S. It was previously from th uh, thirty-nine uh, uh, gigawatts going up to fifty gigawatts by uh, twenty thirty, mm -hmm. and about the wind uh, annual generation, now it will be from uh, it will be moved from sixteen gigawatts. It will go up to uh, twenty-three gigawatts. And as you can see, and uh, any projects, any 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 part of the world that where we um, have renewable energy uh, projects built, then uh, it is going to be more important the energy storage. Uh, in fact, the, the U.S. is the largest storage market uh, right now. So thanks uh, to this uh, act, it will have a boost. No, in, for, in favor of clean power. And by 2030, and just on battery storage or, or energy storage, the country uh, would uh, have 112 gigawatts of energy storage. So that's why we, we mentioned you know, that it is, it's just my matter of follow up on, on, on the news. No? Just now uh, go to the business models no, that we have, the two business models that uh, on, on diversified on, on our strategy. You know? So uh, we have two different kinds of projects. We have the utility scale projects and the distributed generation projects. So just to uh, make a summary, you know, to understand both of them, uh, on utility scale projects, let's say it this way. It's, it's large projects, big projects. Um, um, basically the technology, as I mentioned before, is wind, solar, and, and battery storage. Um, the, uh, it, it takes normally between three to four years, no, from from all the way from greenfield, no, from zero, no, all the way to a project be ready to build or ready for construction. So uh, this is once the, the the project is ready, then we just exit uh, from from it. No, we we sell it. No, so it's um, for uh, the shareholders. Uh, the value for the for the shareholders is that well uh, the milestones payments are uh, related you know, um, to the development progress. While on talking about distributed generation projects, 
Uh, we're talking as an example like rooftop uh, solar uh, projects, battery storage technologies, or CHP, you know, and combined heat and power uh, projects. So these are um, the time is, is shorter. So we are talking about nine, I'm six. I'm sorry, six to uh, nine months of development, and this is a, a difference uh, with, with the others. We own at the end uh, the project. We operate uh, the project. So this will uh, imply a, a long-term cash flow for for the company. But we can go later on on, on that. Yeah, and Martin, just maybe for me to jump in. I mean, this is about that diversification that we kind of mentioned in the first slide, where you're kind of giving giving investors kind of access to that kind of uh, development uh, side of of the kind of sector, where you can kind of get that much larger kind of milestone payments and a lot of leverage on on the on the money that you invest in your projects, but kind of uh, de risk if you want to some to some some extent with the distributed generation market, where uh, the permitting is a lot simpler, the time frame is a lot shorter, and uh, while the projects are smaller, you can get more of them done and start building up kind of that long-term recurring kind of cash flow over kind of 10, 15 years. Um, exactly, exactly. So um, let's let's uh, say it in this way. It's very, in fact, it's a very simple model no, uh, to, to understand where we have, let's divide it in four stages. No, uh, since uh, we start with the project, uh, what I mentioned from Greenfield, from uh, we from zero <laughs> we started uh, we analyze uh, places where according to our experience and according to our knowledge of the market you know has a good potential uh, the wind or solar resource you know, and they, they are strong as well as uh, the uh, prospects uh, of 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 the interconnection and we move to secure the land that will be required for the uh, development construction and, and operation later on no, of, of the project so once the uh, site is identified and we start developing the project which means which means uh, studies like um, environmental studies uh, energy resource assessment we need just to have an idea of how much energy could be produced you know, according to the resource. Um, basic engineering studies, you know, so we can start making some uh, models of uh, where to make the location of, of, of the equipments, uh, depending on the technology, of course. And uh, very important, we start uh, the process on the interconnection you know, for, for the project. So. Omar, sorry. Yes. Um, when you talk about interconnection, that is plugging in your electricity producing project into the grid, basically, because um, like the the utility or the grid operator, like just dumping in a bunch of power, they have to manage that. It, it's a very grids are very uh, sensitive and uh, finicky systems that need to be well managed, and they have to manage how you plug it in, how the rise and decline of the various power inputs into the system are going to affect their overall grid. So that, that's often one of the more um, tricky or more, it can be a little challenging to get to sort all that interconnectivity issues out. Well, I think from a process perspective, it's actually a fairly regulated and formulaic kind of process, Martin. So it's actually, it, it, it's all fairly well laid out pretty much in every, every country that you'll operate in. So in the US, there's kind of a number of steps that you have to follow. In Mexico, it's pretty much the same thing. So I think from a process perspective, it's actually pretty well understood. You can go through it, you know, the costs up front. Um, I think, uh, let's say on the, 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 the probably challenge now is you've obviously got a lot of projects looking to connect. So you're trying to find gaps in the market where you can interconnect um, without generating, let's say, a lot of transmission upgrades. So I think that's really the trick when it comes to interconnection, not necessarily the process or working with the utility, because that's all fairly, fairly, uh, as I said, regulated, fairly well explained. So. I think for us, when we're doing our kind of pre-visibility and, and looking at that step one in this graph, you're looking to find those areas where you, you think that there's potential opportunities to interconnect into existing infrastructure, or uh, let's say what we've done in, in a number of states is you, you've looked at uh, a, lot, a lot of the utilities will have these long-term transmission upgrade plans that they have to publish every year. So you can get a really good read on, okay, let's say in Colorado, I think we, we made a reference to that in the recent announcement we put out, um, the, the, the utility in that state has a, has a fairly sizable transmission upgrade plan that they're going to implement over the next five years. So you can kind of get a sense as to 
where the utilities are looking to put new infrastructure to facilitate in a lot of cases renewables and then you can try to tie your development around that so that's probably more where you kind of have to work out from an interconnection point of view where you're going to site your, your projects but um, as i said the process isn't 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 that overly complicated you just got to go through it and it, it can it can take a couple of years and i think that's probably the biggest lead item in a lot of this the project development on utility scale it can just take two or three years to get through that process of interconnection before you actually have your agreement do utilities or grid operators like put out like requests for proposals saying hey we're building stuff out we'd like someone to uh put in a, a solar or some kind of renewable thing here and then or, or is it that you just scour out different locations say hey there's something in Colorado uh we should uh sort of get in the queue there and uh, obviously I, I've simplified it greatly but yeah no no I mean it's it's it, again it's a bit of everything and it just you'll find it's probably no there's no one answer to anywhere in the U.S. because the states okay. are all different but I think what you find is and again this was some of our rationale as we moved into the U.S. and um, some of the utilities have already announced let's say net zero plans or plans to phase out coal so they've actually given the market pretty clear signals on where they're going with their generation profile that they would like to have in state so you can kind of take a view on that and say well i'd say i think in arizona they've already announced plans to phase out all of their coal by i think it's between 2030 and 2035 so you know all of that capacity is coming off market it's going to be replaced with renewables maybe some natural gas plants but primarily renewables so you can take a view on, okay, maybe it makes sense to develop in Arizona. I mean, that was our thought process as we moved in there. Um, there are some RFPs that do come out, but you generally find this in the regulated markets. Um, like at the moment, there's an RFP out from uh, PNM that's in New Mexico. You've one out from Pacific Core up in, up in Utah and across their, their various different uh, jurisdictions. So you do get those RFPs uh, out as well. I think it's hard to go into those without a development already under underway, if you like, um, okay. because they generally have commissioning dates that will be within, let's say, four or five years. So kind of hard to start right from the start in terms of trying to find the site to match that RFP. Mm -hmm. But again, I think they've already given good signals to the market that this is the way they're going. So you can kind of make kind of educated decisions, if you like, as to where it makes sense to put a project uh, based on where the utilities or 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 corporations in some cases are going and, and so with the utility your model under utility scale is you base you you take it from start and you exit when it's uh um construction ready so basically someone buys the project from you and you say here are all the engineering plans the applications the whole thing now you go build it you you raise the the, the big money to actually build the project and we're going to pay you for all the development work that you, you've done to date yeah exactly exactly and i mean i think we uh, flipped on to the next slide but i think this is the best the best kind of way to show it to you in terms of we set out an illustrative case just to kind of try lay it out easily for kind of investors to understand the model so i guess this is the four steps that omar had mentioned we've given a obviously a very generic idea as to kind of what the costs are for for each step so for a 200 megawatt solar project, not including battery in this case, so just pure solar, <laughs> uh, let's say you've kind of a 2 million investment. A lot of that 2 million is actually at the back end of the project development. So it's not upfront. Actually, your costs in year one are not so great. It kind of builds up as you start to make progress and de-risk the project from a development perspective. Um, that's spent over that three or four years that Omar mentioned. And in, in terms of development returns, and we feel these are kind of conservative, particularly as, as to where you've seen development margins going over the last kind of year or two. Um, you can make on a solar project 40 to 50,000 per megawatt. So an eight to 10 million return on a 2 million investment. And that's right. kind of very roughly kind of, uh, kind of lays it out. And it, it's a lot like I was trying to find a way kind of to simplify it and, and kind of uh, make it more relatable. And it's a lot like general property development where you have a, a greenfield site on an edge of a town you go get it rezoned, you maybe bring some services in in terms of electric and water, and then you, you get permitting from the local council. It's, it's the exact same process, except we're doing it with a renewable energy site. Gotcha. Uh, and this is the kind of returns that you can generate. So there's, there's great leverage that you can get on um, your kind of development expenditure. And if you go back to the first slide that we, we spoke about, which to me is always the key one, a key message we try to get across to investors. Like as a private company, we raise around 3 million US dollars over the period of kind of three years from 2012 to 2015. We developed that 300 megawatts of, of assets that we managed to sell. And we realized 17 million of, of, of revenue for our shareholders. 
So that's right. what we've done historically. This is the illustrative case of kind of what it looks like on a project by project basis. But if you just do the maths, you'll, you'll kind of see see how the, the kind of value attributes to us. So for $3 million pre-public, you generated $70 million of revenue. And if your costs were through, like that seems like a very high return on investment. Yeah, that, that, that's what you can see. And I mean, you'll see that country by country. And I mean, if you look at Europe, these, these development returns will be low in, in, in European terms. I think the US is obviously a competitive market. Development returns are a bit lower. They are starting to go, they are starting to increase. So we think these numbers are conservative. Um, and again, a lot of that comes out of those industry drivers we mentioned, Inflation Reduction Act, um, the kind of drive towards net zero, the need for projects like the ones we're developing, assuming you can get them through to, to kind of ready to build. Um, you, you mentioned along that the projects get de-risked along the way. What's your have... Like, how often do you go through project origination and, I don't know, you spend a couple hundred grand and you realize this project's a dud, we, something changed or we misread something and then you pull the plug on it and go to another one. Is there a lot of failure rate near the beginning of the process or along the way or is it, is it just a lot of sort of hard work? getting over the miles. I mean, there's, yeah, for sure it is. There's definitely projects that will fall through the net. They, they generally do a lot earlier on. So you, 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 you would typically never have hundreds of thousands of dollars invested in a project because they would typically fall down on interconnection. Like you mentioned, that's probably the biggest one because yeah. uh, from a resource perspective, you can actually do a lot of that work on desktop. You can see what the wind resource is generally, what the solar resource is generally. Land, you have site control. Generally site control is not, not that expensive. Um, and uh, it really comes down to interconnection. And it's really that first step of the interconnection process that projects would either need to be maybe redesigned and, and go a different way, maybe uh, go for a smaller project or phase the project. So there's, there's different ways that you can kind of manage them. Um, but you'll generally find out a lot earlier uh, in the process if you're doing your feasibility right. And that's what I was saying in terms of that 2 million, it's, it's not at risk day one, it, it builds up and a lot of it is, is invested when you already have permits in place, when you've already been through your first or second phase interconnection study. Um, and by, the, by that stage, you know you've created that value. You, you know you have a project that you can get to the end if you like. And I would like also to add that uh, it would be uh, somehow uh, easier to identify these kind of uh, um, bottlenecks because if you are stuck in one of these stages, then it's pretty hard just to move to the next one. So we will, the idea is of course that we could identify you know, since uh, an early stage and through the process of the development, what kind of, of um, bottlenecks we, we, can, uh, we can find out and we will struggle you know, in the project and then we can take decisions. Of course, there's no, um, is, there is no a single formula as Steve was mentioning. So it's very important all the time that we have to keep making analysis no, on how the project and each project is moving on. And it depends as well on, uh, on the type of technology no, that we are uh, looking for for that project. Yeah. You, you mentioned that this um, example here um, is without battery. Obviously, you could add a small battery sort of uh, station to a 200 megawatt project or a big one like that's kind of variable how much sort of load leveling or or, or backup you want in there how much additional adding um battery to it would it increase the cost of your getting it to construction ready a lot or does it just add a lot to the final construction part of it because you got to buy the batteries and plug them in yeah no it doesn't add anything to our our, our metric it's more as you said for when you when you're when you're going into uh, construction. I mean, it, it, there's an added complexity. Maybe when you go through interconnection, how are you going to make that battery work work alongside the solar? Will it be front of the meter, behind the meter? But other than that, that's just engineering. It does not does not cost from our perspective. Um, and a, a 200 megawatt solar project, how much capital would like once you exit it, the project owners and how much money are they going to have to put in? What does it cost to actually build a 200 megawatt solar project, roughly? Yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's, again, there's, there's no, there's no kind of great answer, but like 150 million, something like that. Again, it depends. I mean, it, it, a lot of it will depend on interconnection and various different things, but 150 to 200 million. Okay, roughly, roughly. That's, that's good. Yeah, yeah, I'm not yeah, trying to I mean, buy one from you. On, yeah, I mean, it's, right. again, it's, it's just it's sort of a sense of scale. Yeah, again, it's very reasonable. The only, the only final maybe point I'd make on this slide, Martin, is in terms of when we exit, you don't have to wait until you're all the way out ready to build to exit. Historically, what we've done is we've looked to de-risk the project 
from our shareholder perspective, kind of midway through that step two, if you like. So if you look at what we've done historically, we've actually entered into transactions in that more mid-stage development, maybe before it's fully permitted. We've locked in value for our shareholders. Sometimes you're able to take a small bit of value off the table. And then you work with that partner then to bring the project to the final step. And so you'd maybe sell off a portion of it, like call, call it 50%. You sell off, you get some shareholder money back, you, you reduce the risk on it, and then you, you move it forward together? Yeah, no, it's not, not a minority share or anything. You actually give, ex, you give an option to buy the project or, okay. or exclusivity to one particular party. And, and for that, they might pay you an option fee. And then you work with that party to get it fully permitted. And then they buy the project outright once okay. it's ready to build. And so I think the main point is you don't have to wait the three or four years before you sell. Yeah, you can, you can do it in year two. And that's what we've done historically. Just about uh, uh, the portfolio on, on utility scale or in the US, we have well, we have a presence on four states in Colorado, uh, uh, in New Mexico, uh, Arizona, and in, in Utah. And all of them, they are more or less over um, 100 megawatts plus. And we have two main uh, projects that are, that we're talking about 1,250 uh, megawatts that they are moving a very very fast and they have a better progress and, and that's the ones that we highlighted in green and um, basically it, it's about what we have done on, on, on the process on the land management well uh, securing the land basically and about the interconnection process so both of them they are very um, uh, important just to to highlight on what we have done. And it's important also to mention that we started with this portfolio uh, on 2021, and we have doing this progress uh, very rapidly. And hopefully, no, the uh, uh, targets no, for ready to build can be completed by um, the end of uh, 2023, 2024. No? And yeah, the way and to look at this part for me is always, effectively, it's eight opportunities to earn the kind of returns that we that we outline on this. That's the way I, I look at the portfolio. Uh, you've kind of yeah. got eight shots to try to get generate those types of returns. And I think that's interesting when you look back to the market cap of where we currently sit and, and the kind of cash value that you can realize for some of these assets when you kind of start to, to look at that. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a really exciting portfolio. I think we're in some good states, making some good progress on projects. We obviously put out an, an announcement on the Primus Win project there last week, another interesting project in Kit Carson we're making some progress on. The Vernal BES uh, project is also making progress. So, um, I mean, uh, some, some, some good good milestones been hit across the portfolio. So these projects look like they're kind of in phase one, two of your four-step uh, process there. Correct. Yeah, correct, correct. I think the ones in green are the ones we highlight them because they're the ones that are more advanced. So they're getting to that kind of mid-stage development where we've secured site control. We've done some field studies. We're in the interconnection process, we're going past that first step of interconnection. So we're starting to have a reasonably good idea on, on how the projects are shaping up. So with these projects and saying, you're saying after sort of phase two, three in it, you could like sell off some option on it and uh, realize some value. Is that their, their potential? And given that it's a two, three year process, you're, these are 24, 25 uh, ready to build uh, targets on here. So over the coming year, we could would it be reasonable to maybe see some some uh, realization of value out of these projects? Uh, I think there's there's it's, I mean we we highlighted I think Dan and further on down in the presentation I think that that's uh, our hope or at least uh, expectation that we will be bringing some projects to market. Obviously, there's a lot a lot of work to do in between now and then, but yeah, certainly that's that's how we have done it historically. That's that's currently uh, remains the strategy. So I think as we move through the course of next year and start to get some of these projects further de-risked, we will be looking at those kind of transactions for sure. So likewise on the projects that we have in Mexico, you know, in the Northeast, and um, basically they're in, uh, we're talking about wind technology. They are uh, with a good progress and we're just waiting on the uh, market uh, uh, to be open, you know, and, and then we can continue with uh, some of the interconnection process that we need to follow up. It These are uh, the two highlighted green ones there. Those are ready to build in 2023, which is just kind of shockingly not too far away. Are, uh, are, are, are these Mexican projects ones acquired through the Centrica acquisition you announced in the uh, summertime, or are these uh, projects you'd been working on uh, prior to that? 
no, they're, they're, these are our own green fields. So these are utility scale. I think the Centrica was a, was a distributed generation portfolio. It wasn't utility gotcha. scale. So these are projects that we, we, we started developing gotcha. ourselves. I mean, they're, they're, the Alvente Quattro project is fairly late stage, but as in Nueva, maybe not so much, but again, it's kind of mid-stage development. I think a lot of the progress on those projects will really depend on progress with the regulatory framework within Mexico to allow private generation projects to, to, to continue. I think historically Mexico is the fastest growing, one of the fastest growing renewable markets in Latin America. They were adding a couple of gigawatts a year. So it's a really interesting market. I think the last couple of years, it's been a bit slow because the government have looked to change the kind of regulatory regime, but that will get sorted out. Uh, I think there's currently probably two to three gigawatts a year of new generation required just to keep up with electricity demand in Mexico. So you're gonna see as you go forward, it, a requirement for new generation capacity full stop but then obviously the same drivers in most countries a lot of that will come from renewables so we think we're pretty well placed we know mexico extremely well we've had some success down here before these two projects are located pretty close to where we sold projects previously um, so we know this area extremely well and uh, it, from a wind regime perspective or wind resource perspective that this will be probably one of the best areas within within mexico for wind uh, and has a kind of similar profile just north when you go into Texas, which I think Texas at this stage probably has eight or nine or probably even more gigawatts of, of renewables. So now uh, we're talking about the second business model, no? where we are talking about these distributed generation projects no? and the portfolio that we have. So the business model is very simple. No? We look for the project, construct the project, finance, and then we own the project. We operate it. So we uh, kept on a long-term power purchase agreement with a customer. Oh. Yeah, I can, I can go through this, Omar. So again, this is another il il illustrative case, Martin, of kind of what, what does a distributed generation project look like? So we've picked a kind of two megawatt, two megawatt hour battery storage system. You got a couple of steps here that Omar mentioned in terms of project origination, and that's really putting a proposal in front of a customer, uh, running the technical uh, kind of analysis, cost savings analysis, going through their decision-making process, once they decide then to, 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 to go with ourselves, you then got a period of kind of six months in terms of getting the project signed up and getting it constructed. Um, and then you have that 10 year, 10 year plus really, because it depends on the counterparty. Sometimes it might be 15 years, but 10 years would be kind of uh, the average um, uh, for a power purchase agreement with that customer where they're gonna pay you over that 10 year period for, for whatever system you put in. Um, in this case, in terms of a two megawatt hour battery storage system, that's going to cost you around a million dollars to to to, uh, to to install. And in terms of investment returns for our shareholders, we're looking at IRRs of kind of 15% plus. That's on an unlevered and pre-tax basis. And an annual EBITDA of give or take around 180,000. Again, this is just kind of illustrative. On average, every project can be a bit different. Um, <laughs> And, and sorry, with this uh, case study here, um, two megawatts of battery storage. So all you're doing is installing a battery system. There's not actually renewable source attached to it. So what it provides the client, the benefit there is, let's say if there's a power outage, they've got backup, and then they can sort of fill, charge up the batteries when maybe in the middle of the night when power is cheap or whatever the, the the dynamics of that industry are and then drain the batteries what during like peak uh, rate hours yeah more more the last point there actually i mean it, again it, every market is different so battery operates kind of differing dependent on the utility but in, in the case of let's say mexico specifically it's all behind the meter so it's not front of the meter so it sits behind the meat behind the customer's meter uh, as you say uh, a lot of these industrial kind of electricity tariffs are based on uh let's say base intermediary or peak kind of charges. So if, you're, if, you're, if you need, need electricity at the peak, you're gonna pay the highest rate. Plus you're gonna to have to pay the utility like a standing charge for having access to that power during that peak period. So what the battery does is it really takes the energy that they would otherwise buy at the peak um, and provides it through the battery. Uh, so there's cost savings kind of from the customer perspective. And we work that out, we kind of go through the, the customer bills. We look at the customer electricity profile. We, we're kind of, able to determine what those kind of cost savings are on a, on a long-term basis. Uh, and that's why it's interesting to clients. It, it has the added benefits, like you say, that there'll be a small bit of backup power. I mean, they don't, these, these systems are generally an hour or maybe one hour system. So they're not going to provide you with backup power for like four hours or whatever. They're generally a lot shorter term, but they still do provide you with a bit of, bit of that backup standby generation, like you mentioned. 
And they do other things like in some parts of, of Mexico, you'll have issues like frequency issues and power quality issues that are really important for mm -hmm. manufacturing facilities. You've got big kind of uh, big machinery on site. So there's a few other kind of added benefits which they do bring as well. Is this essentially like a financing program for uh, a company? They um, they pay you 180 grand a year over 10 years, call it, uh, to basically fund it? Or is it kind of a profit sharing where uh, depending on where peak rates are and so forth, you you kind of uh, split the cost savings. So maybe some years it's less, some years it's it's more. A bit of both again. I mean, there's there's generally a minimum payment that they have to pay, and then it's the sharing of cost savings. And most of those the savings will be split depending on the project, depending on the peak load. Again, it changes. I mean, if you look at the US with some of the US projects, it'll be a lot simpler. It's just a, a simple capacity payment that you will get for providing access to the battery system for the local utility. So it, the business model depends on, on kind of uh, the, the, where you're installing it, be it in the US, state by state or, or in Mexico. And on a project like this, you don't, your, your plan is not to sell it. You're like the, the utility scale ones, you're going to sell off, let them spend the, the hundreds of millions of dollars to develop it. But you're going to spend what I think you said two, to, one million in total invested by the company, you're going to own that project and then uh, make 180 grand of EBITDA off of it annually as a residual. So there's more of a recurring uh, nature to your revenues as a, as a business. Correct. Yeah. All right. Exactly. Well, and just about uh, this, what we have announced it, uh, is that in, on last August is uh, that we completed the acquisition of uh, the Mexican subsidiary of um, Centrica. Uh, so this is bringing to the company uh, almost six uh, uh, megawatts on, on, on projects on capacity uh, divided on uh, 2.85 uh, megawatts on assets in operation uh, plus another uh, project that it is almost ready and, 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 and is in solid but waiting for the last permits uh, so it can start uh, operations. And uh, this will be according to, as well to the business strategy that we uh, announced it, no, uh, recently about to go into uh, the reno uh, distributed generation market rapidly no? and that can give us a portfolio that can give us the chance of a, make a, um, a good progress and, and growth of our portfolio on, on DG projects. Yeah, I think Marla, the, the only thing I'd add is this, this, this is a kind of really nice acquisition for the for the business. It fast tracked us, as I say, in the, the distributed generation market, but there's, there's there's a lot of upside. Like if you look at the cost, it was $1.4 million. It was in cash and spare parts. So really probably 1.25 million net for what is six megawatts of, of of generation assets. And whatever way you look at that, it's a it's a kind of attractive deal from our shareholders' perspective. If we can bring on this additional three megawatt projects in, in next year, um, you're looking at kind of at least forecasted kind of revenue in EBITDA of close to a million and a half on the revenue side and 700,000 on, uh, on an EBITDA from an EBITDA perspective. So it's a it's a nice kind of acquisition from from uh, from from our, our, our perspective and it fast tracked us into, into the sector as, as, uh, as Omar mentioned. So prior to uh, Centrica, you weren't doing the distributed generation uh, uh, model. This, this is what sort of got you into the market? Yeah, well, we, we had looked at it, so it was on it was on our strategic kind of radar, if you like. But when, yeah. when we looked at it, we said, well, you can kind of go about it two ways. We can we can spend kind of a year trying to build up a team, build up a pipeline, and kind of converting that pipeline. That will take time, or we can see if we can uh, uh, find an acquisition that would suit. That just happened to kind of correspond with uh, Centrica deciding to to step out of the Mexican market. We we knew the guys in Centrica um, from from previous discussions, so we were able to kind of get get a uh, get exclusivity on on the deal and then we use that this deal then to kind of launch our broader ambition into the sector um, and i think it made perfect sense for us because it gives us that operational base even though it's small it's 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 still uh, long-term cash over the next uh, let's say eight years which is the average left on these ppas it gives us the upside on this three megawatt project and then once we got that closed very quickly we announced another another 3.2 megawatt battery projects uh just there in September. So all of a sudden we've gone from six now to nine. And obviously the, the intention is to continue to roll out and get the, the momentum behind it with the pipeline that we have. So, and, and then you, you're just very in the final strokes here to plug in the extra three megawatts of uh, power into the system, which will then start generating uh, revenue from uh, day one. 
Yeah, it's a small bit more to it. It's okay. a, a bit more work, but I, I think in terms of the, 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 the key thing to probably remember is it's it's a, it's a project that's already installed, has already been pre-commissioned. Yeah. So it's sitting in the customer size. So th there is some final permitting that needs to be done. So that needs to be worked through. That's a timing issue from, from as far as we see it. So we try to give a bit of guidance in terms of H1 next year. Obviously, a lot of that will depend on, on how the, the final permitting process goes. But for all intents and purposes, once that once those permits land, then yeah, you will be hoping then to get that project started pretty quickly. This seems like a really good deal. Like it's like a two-year payback or, or something like that. I guess a little bit less. You, you've, you, you It's partially funded with the royalty agreement. So they're clipping a bit of that uh, cash off of it, but um, that looks very impressive. Yeah, yeah, no, no, still, I think even even with the financing that, that, that we got on it, I think it's still an attractive deal for everybody, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So uh, just looking forward on uh, the next year and, and beyond, we will keep uh, basically very active no, on, on our utility scale uh, project. So we will keep developing it and focus on uh, what we have to do uh, on the follow-up on the interconnection process and, and land a, 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 to, to manage no, the, the land that we need to secure for the project. So, so we will just follow again with, with uh, the process that uh, almost looked like a very um, straightforward process. And uh, we will as well keep uh, developing on the permit surveys and studies that we need for uh, the other uh, projects that are in, in our portfolio in the US and in, as well in Mexico, just to keep you know, uh, doing the progress and on, on, on these kind of uh, utility scale projects. And about the second model that we were talking about, the distributed generation, I think that we, we, we want just to take advantage of the momentum in Mexico and in the US as well, because in the Mexican market, this is one of the main topics, uh, DG, you know, so this is a helping companies as we were mentioning uh, on how to achieve their goals on, on net zero emissions and with their uh, ESG, you know, especially in the environmental uh, strategies, strategies that they need to implement. So we will uh, do this and, and developing the, the current portfolio plus uh, some uh, uh, extra portfolio around uh, 40 megawatts of uh, projects that we have on the queue, analyzing. To, so we, we would like just to make progress on, on all of them. And uh, the same no, with, uh, with the rest of, of the projects that we have no, in the full portfolio. Yeah, and probably one point we didn't maybe, maybe touch on, on Martin, which I think is important. And again, it was one of those kind of strategic rationales of going into DG is there is that bit of crossover and synergy between the two, because when we're in front of, let's say, multinationals talking about maybe some small scale solar, they also have or may have much larger kind of power requirements, which may suit some of the utility scale projects that we're doing in terms of trying to contract them to those projects as well. So it's kind of interesting that there, there is a bit of synergy between the two. Also from some of the clients in Mexico may also have operations in the US. So we're seeing some crossover there. So they kind of do while they sit, sit, sit alone and we do have different business models around. There is a bit of synergy between the two of them as well, which is interesting. Not a lot to say on this. I think it's just a summary yeah. of share information. People can find our ticker or EVV so they, they, can, they can find it obviously on the, the Toronto Stock Exchange and just some information in terms of shares outstanding and cash and balance sheet. Yeah, and I guess th things to highlight here, you, you've, uh, you, your cash, your, your debt uh, position doesn't seem, uh, seems reasonable, especially given you've got more than that in cash on hand and you're uh, You've got some cash flow generation happening right now. And then as well, uh, man, insiders own 60-ish percent, which is a good chunk. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I mean, we're under, uh, following the RTO, a lot of that is under escrow arrangement as well. So we're, we're certainly here for the long term. We're fairly committed. Uh, we, a good few of the management would have invested in the RTO fundraising as well. And so continue to support the business. All right. We do have questions from the audience here. So uh, any questions? Uh, uh, final comments before we switch over to the cues. No, no, happy to happy to answer questions. All right. Uh, is, is the company planning on any investor roadshows in Canada and the U.S. or presenting at renewable energy conferences in the coming months? Uh, I guess the short answer is yes. Uh, definitely on the agenda. So we're, we're constantly looking at them. Uh, I think it's trying to find the one that it's trying to find the, the right one that marries both renewables and kind of that investor aspect as well. I think which is pretty key. Um, but yeah, no, definitely, it's 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 on our, on our agenda. Can you discuss the financing needs in order to reach the uh, project monetization for use utility your utility scale project development? Or I guess 
Uh, it's a great question. Are, are you going to have to raise more capital? Are you fully financed here to get the uh, your utility projects, or I guess all of your projects, over the uh, the finish line? Yeah, well, I mean, we haven't provided any guidance in terms of future financing needs, so we won't talk specifically about it. But I think if you look at what we've done historically, Aaron, or what we at least what we've tried to do is we raised that three million that I mentioned as a kind of private company. We didn't raise any further funds until we exited projects, and then we we were effectively self funded. So that's that's. The model that you look to replicate it's not always always possible to get the timing exactly right where you can kind of exit a project realize some value before you have to raise money again but that's certainly the intention and um, there are plenty of other kind of financing options out there for renewable renewable energy companies such as ourselves as well so we're constantly looking at potential funding options and um, i think in terms of the the overall plan i mean if you look at the projects we have under the de development and that two million per project uh, obviously there will there is further capital to get every single one of those projects to ready to build but that's not, not not to say you don't fund those out of selling another project or some other financing so it's kind of difficult yeah. to give a, a kind of specific answer on it if you know what I mean gotcha so but you've got it does seem like you have a fair amount of flexibility you can sell the options earlier on on some of these projects that are getting close to ready to build you could sell off some of you've got some cash flow now um sure. so there is uh, uh several things you can do there but Correct. Like financing, yeah. it's always a, a moving target and so forth. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, has the uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, increased utility scale project valuations? Uh, I guess the, the the short answer is not not on its own. I, th I think what it will do, which is probably more interesting, is it, it because it's now basically set the runway for the next ten years in terms of tax incentive schemes to support renewables. What that will do, or what it has done, is give a very clear signal to investors. And I'm talking about kind of utilities, institutional investors who want to own kind of the, the, the projects that we're developing, that the U.S. is the market to be in. So if you're not in the U.S. already, I would say it's probably definitely on the, on the radar of, of companies who are going to come in. So I think it will bring in more um, potential buyers of the projects that we're looking to develop. Uh, whether that leads to increased valuations, we need to see. But I, I think in, intuitively, you would think, yes, more competition for projects should increase valuations. But I don't think it's specifically because of the IRA. I think it's it's a lot of different things that are that are in there, um, because I mean even even pre that that piece of legislation getting enacted, I mean the, the U.S. market was extremely active uh, already. This just then has set that scene now for the next ten years. Exactly. Yeah. I think it's a clear right. message, you know, and a clear signal from the government in the U.S. of what they want to do in the in the renewables no, in, in the US. And absolutely, this will have an impact on infrastructure and uh, energy consumption and diversification of the matrix, as I was mentioning at the, at the, at the beginning. So absolutely, it will have an impact, a general impact on all the renewable energy projects in, in the US. And absolutely, it's it's the main place where, you know, the main market now that everybody is going to be looking for. All right. Um, you, you made a comment, and I actually don't remember hearing this, but there's a question here. Could you elaborate on your comment that on waiting for the Mexican market to open? Yes, um, that the, the, the current administration no, uh, just a, a, a move uh, to uh, different priorities, let's say it that way. So the market has been uh, just based uh, or focused on, on the DG uh, uh, portfolio of, of renewable projects and the large uh, utility scale projects have been uh, more on the uh, utility uh, uh, electricity company in Mexico uh, so we will be just uh, we're just waiting until the current administration it's going to open again you know uh, these kind of a uh, utility scale projects to go ahead and they already have announced, for example, a, a solar a large project in, in Sonora, and we're just waiting on, on, on the administration just to keep demanding and opening for these uh, sort of projects that will be absolutely you know, uh, helping to, to the country to progress and, and, and to achieve, of course, the uh, targets that they have for 2024 and, and for 2023. Yeah, I think if I, you find this sometimes, Martin, where like the, the Mexican market was, as I said, one of the fast growing markets, a lot of a lot of capacity getting added, a new government come in, they have a kind of different viewpoint as to how they want the regulatory system to be set up. It takes a number of years to kind of that for that to work through the political kind of system. I think that was up for a vote. Uh, was it earlier this year? It didn't get through. 
So the existing framework remains in place in Mexico, which allows private generation projects. I think the government just need to figure out how they can match what their objectives are with allowing further private generation to, to, uh, to come on stream. But they've been very clear all along that I think it's 45% of the market they're, they're leaving for private generation projects. So it's just a case of when, from our perspective, I think the longer you go on, the bigger the issue becomes for them. Because if you go back to that energy demand issue, I mean, you're starting to add like three to 4% on your electricity demand every year. That's in like in a country like Mexico, that's three, four gigawatts, you know, of new generation capacity, which hasn't been met for the last couple of years. And it just backs up. So at some point, um, they're going to have to figure this out. I think in the last two weeks, you've started to see some positive noises through some uh, intergovernment meetings with the US and with Canada. Um, so I think the noises have, have certainly uh, improved over the last couple of weeks, but we, we just kind of have to wait and, and sit it out. But as I said, I think we're fairly well positioned with some good projects and good areas that, that we know uh, work from previous experience. All right, and then one uh, final question here on your distributed business. Uh, and the, the question is how quickly do you expect you can grow that distributed business? And, and I guess the another way of phrasing it is how many new projects do you think you can add on a year or, or what is your capacity or the market's capacity to, to add those on? Yeah, I mean, again, we haven't given much much guidance in terms of what we expect going forward. But I think what we will say is, uh, like, we've got the central transition or acquisition obviously completed. We've announced one project already. I think we've indicated in this presentation we've got another forty megawatts plus. That's probably uh, more now than it was even I think when we put the presentation together. So that number is certainly increasing. So we're we're seeing a, a lot of opportunities on the distributed generation side, and I think a lot of that is driven by general electricity prices. I think if regardless of what market you're in now, if you talk to companies, they're suffering with much higher electricity bills, uh, capacity charges. So there's a, a much bigger drive for them now to be looking at these types of projects. Um, so I think that the, I won't say it's it's kind of endless because there's, there's obviously a finite amount of the projects, but it's certainly growing pretty quickly, uh, both across Mexico, the US and, and indeed in Canada as well. So it's, it's a fairly fast growing sector. All right, and then one final uh, question for me before we wrap this up. Uh, what types of news flow should investors be looking for over the next three, six, nine months? Announcement of new projects, maybe selling off or optioning off some projects, that sort of thing, or it can give some uh, uh, more thought of, on that? Yeah, we kind of we kind of try to lay it out in that that kind of slide that Omar went through uh, in, in terms of what to expect from us. So you, you'll definitely. We'll obviously be updating the market as we bring through some of the utility scale projects uh, as they hit various milestones we'll certainly be communicating communicating that to shareholders we've mentioned things like potential potential uh, sales of assets next year obviously that's um, something we'd like to achieve very hard to, to pin that down right now but it's, it's certainly something we'd like to move towards and then on the dg side i guess you'll have a you'll have a couple of different things one we'll be reporting and obviously the progress of the centric acquisition hopefully quarter one results will contain the first revenue generated and that will build over the course of next year. So you'll start to see the full year impact of that coming through early next year. We'll hopefully be bringing on that battery project that we announced in, in Cancun that'll come operational again, that'll start building cash and cash and revenue for us. So I think it expect us to be busy for sure. Like there's a lot of, lot of, lot of projects in the portfolio um, on the utility scale. And as I said, the DG part of it is, is growing quite a lot as well. Excellent, guys. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time to talk oh, with us. Appreciate it. Uh, we learned a lot here and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Martin. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks you, Martin. Much.